I guess we'll begin in John chapter 6 today. There's a few things that we need to see. Uh, there's a phrase in the Word of God that's only used six times. Um, I, just, I just have them printed off here. I, I, like I said, I really have no idea what God is going to do with this, if He does anything with it. We may read down through these six verses in the next ten minutes, and we might go home. Uh, honestly, it would be better if I were to step down off of this pulpit and we go home than for me to try to preach something without the anointing of God. Uh, I don't feel a lack of that today. For what I do have is a complete lack of understanding as to where God is going to take us today. So let's just dive into this and see. Uh, before I begin, Theron, would you ask the Lord to bless the time of preaching? Dear Lord, we come humbly before you now, Lord, as a congregation. I pray that you would uh, speak to us today through your servant. I pray that you would uh, work in his heart and his mind, Lord, and give him the words that you would have for us today. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, uh, I'll, I'll give a little background as to how, why I came upon this, this uh, phrase. I was in John 10, just going through everything of, uh, that we didn't get through last week and uh, all, of, all of these different things. I, I spoke on how Jesus said, I'll give unto them eternal life. Uh, and that life is in Jesus Christ. It is that spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's that same spirit that he commended under the hands of the Father. It's that same spirit that the Father gave back to him when he resurrected, and that is what actually that's what made him rise from the dead. Uh, and we went through all of those things, and then it continues and says, They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. That, that drove me over here to John chapter 6. And I fell on this thing. There was other things in John 6 that I was looking at. And uh, as the Lord quite often does, as it says that the, the comfort when he has come, he shall guide you into all truth. Uh, John 14 also tells us that the comforter is the Holy Ghost. Okay, so as the Holy Ghost is guiding you through all truth and uh, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The only truth you're ever going to find on this planet is in this book that's sitting in your lap. That's it. It's the only place you're going to find it. And as, as he guides us through the word of God, he speaks to our hearts and he, and he brings things out to us. I've spoken with a couple of you just recently. Uh, one young man in here uh, texted me the other night and we were going back and forth. And he, he mentioned how the Lord had showed him this thing. And then this part over here caught his eye and that brought this thing to mind. And so he turned over there and looked and went here and went there. And, and I said, glory to God, that's the Holy Ghost. That's God working in a man. And... When those things begin happening, the hand of God is made manifest. And that's how you know this book is alive. It's not just ink on a page. This is the living Word of God. Amen. It's alive today just as much as the day it was penned. And it's eternal. Because the Word was with God and the Word was God. And so as we see Jesus Christ in ink and paper today. I was going through a few of these things and, and my eyes came over to John uh, 6, 28. And when we had gone through John chapter 6, we, we went through this and, and we, we labored in this a little bit because of that word labor in verse 27. It says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Look at that E-T-H again. Let me tell you what, when you start seeing these things, you're going to see it everywhere. And it, it really gives clarity to the Word of God, which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? They, they had a desire. 
to work the works of God. But Jesus didn't use the word work. He used the word labor. Okay? Labor is that earnest seeking, that diligent seeking. As you are seeking God, whether you're lost or whether you're saved, that diligent laboring to enter into that rest, according to Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, there are so many times, sadly, that in fundamental churches, good Bible preaching fundamental churches, where we put such an emphasis on the idea that it's not of works, it's not of works, it's not of works, we take the labor right out of it. Now, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's, it's uh, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us. All our righteousness are filthy rags. All right, and what those filthy rags are, it's those cloths that were used to wipe a leper's body, to get rid of that pus and that infection and that death and decay. That's what that righteousness is. And that righteousness is before we're saved and after we're saved. Anything that we ourselves produce is a filthy rag. The only thing good in us is Jesus Christ. You say, well, what about the lost person? Well, John chapter 1 tells us this. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The light of Jesus Christ, in the candle of the Lord, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, lighting the inward most parts of the belly. Okay? It's showing you who you are on the inside. That light of Jesus Christ, according to your Bible, is in every man, woman, and child the moment they're born. It's in there. That's why Romans chapter 1 says that they're without excuse. That's why there isn't a single atheist today who is a true atheist. They're just angry at God. That's what it is. It isn't that they don't believe in God. They've con convinced themselves that there is no God, and they've chosen not to believe what God wrote. They've chosen not to believe what God has put on them on the inward parts. You wonder why there's so much depression, so much pain, so much... <clears throat> there's a, there's a, a, a pattern that is emerging. The pattern in this world is that well, just as we looked in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, that there are those that promise liberty, false teachers. Now, whether it's a false teacher of doctrine, whether it's a false teacher of worldly philosophy, whatever it is, they are teaching falsely because they are not following the word of God. And these promise them liberty, just like the liberty that that maniac who had the legion of devils over in Gadara, that he was able to break the chains and the, the fetters asunder. Because of the devils which were in him, the world would look at that and say, look what liberty he has. But he was confined to the tombs. He was cutting himself all the time, crying out, trying to destroy himself. And this pattern that you see emerging, and you'll see it more and more and more in our country, is God takes his hand of protection away, as he which letteth, Let's not quite as much. And again, that word let there, he which letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That letting isn't in allowing. That letting is in holding back. Okay? There's two definitions of the word let used in your King James Bible. One is to allow. Let every man which nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God lets you do that. That's a mercy and a grace from God. Amen. However, he that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, what is he holding back? Well, we've studied that out just recently. He's holding back that spirit of Antichrist. He's holding back that, uh, uh, that reprobate mind. Okay? Uh, don't you know you're in Christ except you be reprobates? You're either in Christ or you're a reprobate. And the only way a lost person is not given over to that reprobate mind is that the Holy Ghost is holding that thing back like the walls of a dam. But when that dam is removed, that town is inundated with water and destroyed. And that's what's happening right now in our country. The Holy Ghost is holding back that spirit of Antichrist. That Holy Ghost is holding back that reprobate mind. However, 
according to Romans chapter 1, a national heart of a people given over to sodomy, which is what we are seeing in America right now, that is God's punishment on a people for their idolatry. You read down through Romans chapter 1. Let's go there. We'll go there. Uh, Romans chapter 1. Uh, verse, yeah, we'll start at verse 20 because then we'll talk about that light and then we'll talk about 21 and we'll go on from there. Verse 20, Romans chapter 1. Thus saith the Lord, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen by un being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Everyone who has ever lived has looked at creation and known that there's a God. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Now, you study those imaginations. Where are the imaginations always connected with? You study that word throughout your entire King James Bible, and every single time it's connected with the heart, never once with the mind. Your heart and your mind are two different things. They have their own thoughts. Your heart is that thing which speaks inside of you. Hannah prayed in her heart. That's where you pray from. That's where you sing in your heart, making melody unto the Lord. All right? It's the part of you on the inside that, that, that speaks. Your mind is, is that analytical thinking part. All right? It's processing all of this, and it decides what to make your body do. You follow your carnal mind, you're going to be living a carnal life. You follow the mind of Christ, you're going to be living a Christ-honoring life. Okay? Those are your two options. Your spirit directs your mind to pick one or the other. You have an unclean spirit about you, you're going to be going to unclean things. You have the spirit of Christ and you have the mind of Christ, you're going to be living for Christ. All right? It's as simple as that. You wonder why you don't have any victory in your life? It's because your spirit is unclean. It's because you haven't been washed with the water by the word. That's why it's so easy to live Sunday afternoon, or even during this half hour that I'm going to be preaching. It's easy to live for God. It's easy to think on spiritual things. It's easy to follow along in the Word of God and to find these things if you'll allow God to do that. But Monday, you're out of this element, and it begins to fade. You see things in the world. You're, 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 by, by seeing and hearing, your righteous soul is vexed by the ungodliness of this world. But it says there, they became vain in their imaginations, and look at this, and their foolish heart was darkened. Their, plural, heart, singular. Okay, this is talking about a people group and the collective heart of the people. You see this mentioned time and time again with the Israelites as they're wandering through the wilderness. When they said with one voice, or they said, the people of Israel said this, and there's one statement that's being made, one person was speaking, most likely, and the rest of them were agreeing in their heart. Yes, that is, I'm right on board with that. Okay, crucify him, crucify him. Okay, they said, let his blood be upon our children. They said that in their heart, most of them. They were saying amen to it, okay? And the nation of America has been given over in their heart, collectively, to sodomy. This is what has befallen our country. It's what has befallen our nation. And when that Equality Act came out, I preached this whole thing that this is the biblical perspective of this thing. God will not punish anyone for the sin of sodomy. The sin of sodomy is the punishment from God for idolatry. It says so right here. Professing themselves to be wise, verse 22, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Now it says an image. That's one image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. This is the picture of a cherub. You see this whole same thing in, in Ezekiel chapter 1 listed out. This is what a cherub looks like. And so what this is, is they have changed, not exchanged, not traded out, but they changed it. 
How do you change something like this? Well, you change the word of God to make it say what you want it to. You change the God of glory into this abomination. And it's not an abomination necessarily in the sense that it isn't, it isn't what God designed because those cherubs are God's design. But what it becomes an abomination is, is this is that they changed the image, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, one image, one cherub, one anointed cherub, Satan. That is what they did. Made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. This is one image. Wherefore, okay, we're about to see why. Okay, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. Now, who gave them up to uncleanness? God. Through the lusts of their own hearts. Oh, there's an interesting thing. Your lust is contained in your heart. That's where it is at. That's where it, that's where it originates. It's the lust of your heart. Okay? It, your heart is the, the, the seed of your desires. Everything that you desire in this world is encompassed in your heart. The thoughts and the imaginations of your heart are only wicked continually. Okay? Uh, when Noah and everybody was there at the end of the flood and God remembered Noah and looked down on him and said, I'll never again uh, destroy the earth like this because the imaginations of their heart are evil from their youth. Okay? Now, what is their youth? Well, at 12, Jesus was still called a child. Okay, so according to the word of God, I guess youth is after that. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Okay, it is a dishonor. Fornication is a dishonor. Adultery is a dishonor. Sodomy is a dishonor to your own body. Now, the marriage bed is honorable before the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. It's undefiled before God. Used to be a priest couldn't come at his wife for three days before he performed his duties. Now it is a husband and wife can be together in that way and they can immediately during the act go to God in prayer. That's how holy of a thing that is. Because God's in the middle of it. Glory to God for that. But it is a dishonor. Fornication, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6, fornication is the only sin that you commit against your own flesh. It's against your own body that you're committing this thing. Adultery is the only sin in the Word of God that is mentioned that you commit against your own soul. Why? Because that is supposed to be the picture of the intimacy between Christ and His church. Oh, but what God ordains, Satan corrupts. And now we are where we're at. But it says, who changed, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Now, how would they change the truth of God into a lie? To change the truth of God. Where is the truth of God contained? In the Bible. And so what they have done is they have either excused it away, retranslated it, made it into this abomination that somewhat sort of looks like the Bible, but, oh, you've got to have this one and this one and this one and this one and this one, or this commentary and this Bible study help and this lexicon and, and this dictionary and all of it. You've got to have all of these things in order to understand the Word of God. And I'm telling you what, from a lost mindset, you absolutely need all of those things. But you know what a Christian needs to understand that Bible? God. Period. This Bible, the Holy Ghost, plus nothing. You say, oh, well, it's, it's just so hard to understand. Okay, yeah, I get that. God didn't intend it to be easy to understand. Why do you think he spoke in parables? Why do you think the entirety of the Old Testament is written in mysterious form? It was to hide it from the prudent and from the wise, so that he could reveal it unto babes. So that the kingdom of God could be within you. 
Listen, when we looked at, at, at Pilate, we looked at Pilate. Where, where did we look at Pilate? Where was Pilate? John chapter 19. Let's go to John chapter 19 real quick. Keep your place in Romans. We're not done there yet, I don't think. John 19. Oh, no, sorry, John, John 18. John 18, verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? All right, so Pilate asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of me? Did you hear this from man, or did God reveal this thing to you? Jesus told Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. There are things in this book that man has revealed to us, and they very well may be true. Was it not true? He is the king of the Jews. Absolutely. Did Pilate believe it? No. Do you know why? Because man had revealed it unto him, not God. How big is your God? Is your God big enough to still teach you this book? Without me? Oh, yeah, definitely without me. But is, is, he, is he big enough to teach you this book alone? You know what, what arrested my attention? And this was probably maybe around 2016-ish. I was reading about the life of David Livingston, and I don't have all the details hammered down like I used to in this thing, but as David Livingston was, was working his way into the heart of Africa, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles into the jungles, and he was getting way, way, way back in there, he started out with a whole entourage. And he had all sorts of materials, he had a whole library with him, he had all these other things, do you know what he had by the time he finally got to where he was going? His Bible and his pants. That's it. And God kind of smote my heart with that, and because I had, I had all of these, I had this wonderful library that had been given to me, and uh, I had all these other study helps, and I had this Bible software, and I had that Bible software, and I had this thing, and that thing, and, and all of this, and I had all these resources, and I had the internet, and I had all these commentaries. I mean, I had everything. And I studied those stuff. I, I studied it. I mean, I was diligent in my studying. And God kind of smote my heart and said, you know, if, if Livingston could do it, why can't you? And it took another three years before I actually began believing that. But I trust my Bible, every word of it now. And I've got to tell you, I've learned more since 2019 than I did from 1985 all the way up till then. 1985 is when I was born, by the way. Okay. My age berayeth me. But Pilate had heard this of of other people, flesh and blood had revealed it. God hadn't revealed it to them. That's why Jesus, and again, remembering everything in John, every conversation Jesus has is he's, he's pointing a finger on their unbelief. Pilate came in there with authority. He came in there with power. He came in there with this thing of being able to, to uh, execute or to save. Jesus says, thou couldest have no power at all except, uh, against me except it were given thee from above. And he walks in there and says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, just like our Lord is, says, who told you this? Did man tell you this or do you think of this you're on your own? You know, those of you who are in here to lost today, you, you've, you've been seeking God and, and God, is, God has revealed himself from time to time to you. And in, in talking with you, I've, I've heard from one of you that, you know, there, there's this, this mindset of, you know, I used, to, I used to read and study the Bible, but I did it in light of everybody else. But now I've got to read, learn how to read the Bible and see that it's me. It's me. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's so easy to look at everyone else. 
Honestly, if there is only one person in here, and understand my heart as I say this, and I hope you do, there's only one person standing in here. Well, actually, that's true. Everyone else is sitting. But there's only one person in here that should look with a righteous judgment upon everyone else that's in here. And that's the under-shepherd. Because I'm to know the state of my flock. And God gives the man of God a little bit of perception of things. The more I get to know you and the more I get to know my God, the more I see things and the more I know better how to pray. But for the av average pew sitter, the average churchgoer, the average person who is a lay speaker, however you want to list all, each individual one out, that's not your job. That's not a burden that God has given you to bear. Why take it up? Why are you picking up the, the mantle of, of a bishop when you're either not qualified, you're not called, you're not that one? Don't do that. That's dangerous. It will destroy you with bitterness. Not only that, it'll puff you up. And it'll blind your own eyes to your own wickedness. It'll blind your own eyes to the wickedness and the deceitfulness of your own heart. And you're going to be looking at everyone else's faults, never realizing that the things you see most in everyone else, that's what you're the most guilty of. Boy, that person is just so full of pride. Yeah, it's because you are. Boy, that person is just so, so evil to their wife. Yeah, it's because you are. Okay? These are the things that that Satan uses to blind us to the truth. Okay. Um, that, that whole thing of flesh and blood, revealing it. We've had lots of people reveal things to us, and they very well may have been true. But if it wasn't God that brought the word of God to you, it wasn't for you that day. Now, let's consider this. Back in Romans chapter 1. Uh, they changed the truth of God into a lie, worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So they were, they were involved in idolatry. Okay, This is what it, it is encompassing. This is why God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. All right? Verse 26, for this cause, for what cause? Because they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Okay? For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. I love the way the King James Bible puts things. This is something so a 10-year-old child can listen to it, and a 35-year-old convict who's been in jail for 30 of his 35 years on this life. And the word of God pierces, isn't it dividing asunder of soul and spirit? That means that it, it causes a division in you. Divides it right in between, so you can distinguish between the two. And of the joints and the marrow, and, and it affects you physically. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of, uh-oh, the heart. And when that word pierces you, as it does here, even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. If we were to get an honest poll, of this church. And if we could see the innermost desires of your wicked heart, mine included, and without names and without uh, attributes being put on one or the other so that you would distinguish who was who and what was what, if we were to get an honest poll of the people sitting in this room today, those who are guilty of sodomy, in their heart, would be nigh unto 100%. There are people that I know personally that have crossed those boundaries. Now, I don't say this as an accusation, but I want us to realize is that your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And it says it's that above all things. You can't know it, but God can. And God does. God is the only one that knows the innermost thoughts of your heart. And Jesus is the only one who has ever walked this earth that knew the thoughts of the heart of people. 
you know, honestly, if you want to, if you want to have a little more ammunition against some cults, take that concept of Jesus perceiving the thoughts of their heart, answering them before they even articulated it with their lips, and then connect it there in the Old Testament where it says, God, Lord, thou alone knowest the thoughts of the heart. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Okay? It doesn't take much imagination to understand what's going on. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Now, what was their error? Was it the error of sodomy? No, it was the error of idolatry. And this is where America is at right now. And going back to where we started, the more and more that America is given over to this thing, we're going to begin seeing like what, things like what the kids saw over in that school project. That devilish activity. You're going to be seeing it more and more and more, manifested more and more and more. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm not saying this to be a doom and gloom kind of fella. I'm telling you, this is what is coming. Because it says the evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Shall, sorry, shall, not will. Shall, it's an absolute, it's going to happen. In those last times, last days, perilous times. Because they're lovers of their own selves, boasters, blasphemers, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And then <laughs> the craziest thing about that is it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. That's in the church. So, by way of introduction, John chapter 6. Verse 28 says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. The work of God is a statement that is made six times in your Bible. And every single time, it's pointing to this very thing. Did you know that you believing on him whom he sent is a work that God does? You say, well, that's Calvinism. No, that's what your Bible says. There's so much, listen, we don't even have to go into this whole thing. There's so much scripture that negates Calvinism, even on a one-point Calvinistic point, that we don't even need to go into any of that. And this church is well-versed enough in it, we're not going to go there today. Whosoever will may come. It's in your will to come. Some will, some won't. And God knows. That's his foreknowledge. Those who will come unto him, he will in no wise cast out. There's God's will. And those that come unto him and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou shalt be saved. Believe what? Well, believe that Christ died and was buried according to the scriptures and rose again according to the scriptures. What scriptures? Those Old Testament scriptures. Basically, it's as simple as this. Believe what God wrote about himself, and you'll be saved. That's what it boils down to. But this belief. You remember, he that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Understanding that your whole heart is sick, and the, or the whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. 
and that your whole flesh, your whole body is, is full of putrefying sores from the crown of your head to the bottom of your foot. And that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that worketh himself up to seek after God. There is none that are looking after him. Many times, twice, at least I know, in Psalms, God says, he looked down out of heaven to see if there were any that sought after God, and he found none. So how is it that a person can seek after God when, so, when God says nobody is seeking him? It's because he draws you. Well, how do I know if God is drawing me? You're sitting under the preaching of the word of God today, aren't you? That means he's drawing you. Or else you wouldn't be here. Now, I believe there are some that he's drawing, that in their will, they are resisting him, and that is a deadly, dangerous place to be. Because he will give you over to that reprobate mind. You resist and resist and resist. There is a sin unto death. The Bible says that. How many years did God give Israel before he gave them over into captivity? 490. Which just happens to be 70 times 7. If you believe your Bible. Now. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Now, how is that even possible? How does that work? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31, please. Deuteronomy 31. This the Lord showed me just as we were sitting in, in uh, Sunday school this morning. Deuteronomy 31, starting at verse 11, says, When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. You remember there is foolishness bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction driveth it far from him. The problem that we are having today is children are passing from their childhood, where foolishness is bound up in their heart. They're passing into their youth, where that foolishness is now sealed in their heart. And it was never driven from them. That's why we have children telling parents what to do. That's why we have children mocking adults and telling adults what to do. Do you know what happened to those children that mocked Elijah? Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. The she-bears came out and tore them. Every single one of them. You say, well, that's harsh. No, that's what God considers righteous and just. And children ought to start to learn how to speak to adults. Our children included. The children that attend this church need to start to learn how to speak to adults. I got one amen on that because it hurts. I understand. But it's the truth. Now, now I don't say that out of anger. I say that with a broken heart. Because I know how much it hurts God's heart. If they don't hear it here, where are they going to hear it? That they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe all the, uh, to do all the words of the law. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. As long as you live in the land, whether you go over to, to Jordan to possess it. Now, what does this have to do with the work of God? Well, we needed to look at how the law of God brings the fear of God. The reason that there is no fear of God before their eyes is because there is no law of God before their eyes. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. And they are ignorant. Now, ignorance isn't an excuse, because there's none with excuse. We already saw that in Romans. I love how the Lord stitched that together. Let's go to Exodus 32. With this, with this chapter in mind, Exodus 32. Exodus 32, and I don't know where we're going to start. I guess 15. 
It says, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables which were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other, were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Now, this is the very first place that this phrase, the work of God, shows up in your Bible. Now, what did Jesus say the work of God was? That ye believe on him whom he hath sent. How do you believe except you have the word of God? And what God did was he gave to Moses for the very first time, wrought by his own hand, the work of God. And the word of God. The tables were the work of God. What was on those tables? Which is the law. He gave him the law. And this is where it began. Now, with this in mind, go to Galatians chapter 3. Let's keep these things in our hearts, in our mind. The law of God is there to make us fear God. The law of God is the work of God. The work of God is that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Galatians 3 and verse 22, yeah, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. What scripture is that? The law and the prophets and the Psalms. The scripture, the entirety of the word of God hath concluded all under sin. Now, one thing that my wife has found just as of late is this statement here is changed in many a Bible from concluded to, what was it, enslaved? Imprisoned. Imprisoned. Okay? But the scripture hath imprisoned all under sin. So the scripture is the thing that actually imprisoned you in your sin. No. It's just made a conclusion. All are under sin. By the way, if you look at James Strong's definition, he has imprisoned in there. Might as well go to the New Bibles. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ, now there it is, not in, it's of. So by faith of Jesus Christ, so that promise came by faith of Jesus Christ. Of meaning where it originated, the promise came by Jesus Christ and his faith. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. What faith is that? The faith of Jesus Christ. That's the faith that was revealed to us. It's one of those mysteries that was given to us through the Apostle Paul as he expounded these things. That abundance of revelations that he received of Jesus Christ in that Arabian wilderness, that is those things for which he had that thorn in his flesh so that he wouldn't be exalted above measure. Okay, All of these things are being expounded to us now. But before faith came, we are kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should be afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that, after what? After that faith, after that faith was come, the faith of Jesus Christ, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Let's see. Yeah, that's where we're going to stop there. Now, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Deuteronomy 31 tells us that the law of God was given so that we would fear God. In uh, Exodus 32, 16, it says the tables were the work of God. Those tables on which the law was given. That work of God is the law of God given that you might believe. And it says that the scriptures concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You're not going to be able to believe until you have the word of God. You're not going to be able to believe until you have the law of God. You're not going to be able to believe until you see these things from the scriptures. That's why God gave us his word. That's why God preserved his word. That's why it's perfect in every essence of it. 
God does not do anything imperfect, no matter what the modern Bible scholars tell you. Don't believe them. They're promising you liberty by going to all these things. And the liberty in this mindset is, oh, God gave it imperfect on purpose. As we read in that, that Logos magazine, what's it called? Bible study. Put out by Logos Software. It's the man that originated that Bible software, which was originally from his lexicon, was a pedophile. And was involved in spiritism. And this is where we're going to get our deeper knowledge of the Word of God. It pains me. But if you take the Word of God for what it says, and you just believe it as it's written, it says that the tables were the work of God. Psalm 64, 9 says, And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. Consider the work of God, Ecclesiastes 7, 13, For who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? Ecclesiastes 8, 17, Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. You know, in the wisdom of God, I, I'll, I'll turn there, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1. And verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You see, that's how God's wisdom is manifest, is that you can't know him by wisdom. By your own wisdom, by your own learning, by your own knowledge, you cannot know him. The only way you can know him is to believe what he wrote about himself and what he wrote about you. It's the only way you can know him. Which really takes us completely out of the picture, and it's all on God. Which is what we say it is anyways, right? That, that's scary. That's scary when we actually have to trust God to do all the work. We're just going to leave that one set there for a little while. The next place this is used is in John 6, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him who he hath sent. Now, up until this point, that belief is the work of God, and it's shown in the law, and it's shown that it doesn't come by wisdom, and it's shown that it only comes through the word of God, and that whole thing is so that you would fear God and believe. That's the work of God. He works that thing in you. It is your choice to believe or to stand in unbelief, but he gives you every single thing you need to believe. But what about the Christian? What about once you've believed? What's the work of God then? Romans 14. We're actually going to close here. Romans chapter 14. And verse 20. Now, a little, little background. Romans 14 and Acts chapter 15 are dealing with this whole thing of uh, meat being offered to idols and circumcision and, and all of this other stuff. Okay, This is speaking of the liberty in Christ that we have once we've been made free. Okay, and It says this uh, in Romans 14. Let's start at verse 19. Yeah, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Boy, if we would just follow that, our Christian life would be a whole lot easier with one another. Do you know that the church is a building? Did you know that? I mean, we've heard it preached so many times that the church isn't a building, it's the people. Yeah, but the Word of God says the church is the building. And that we are the building of God, fitly joined together. And a building is an edifice. It's a built-up structure. And never once is the church told to encourage one another. Never one time. You're not going to find the word encourage in your New Testament anywhere. 
To encourage is to place courage in somebody. What we're to do is exhort and edify. An exhortation is to correct or to admonish and to bring to a point where you are, you are strengthening them and you are making it so that they can go forward and do better. Many times uh, preaching is just a simple exhortation. Hey, this is what the Word of God says. Let's go ahead and start doing that. That's an exhortation. To edify is to build up. And we're told to, we're to build up one another here. It says the things wherewith one may edify another. Look at this. It says, for meat, destroy not the work of God. How about that? Now, what are we equating with the work of God? What does the Bible define the work of God as? This is the work of God, and then here's the definition, that you believe on him who he hath sent. Now, for meat, what is that saying? I can eat meat and you can't. I can eat this meat offered unto idols, but this person over here used to offer those things unto idols, and he can't eat those because for him it's sin. For me, that's never a problem in my life. I can eat that stuff and it doesn't bother me at all. It is, has no bearing on my Christian walk whatsoever. However, that one over there must stay away from it. All right? Those of you who have dealt with different perversions in your life or different uh, addictions in your life or however it may lay out, there are things you know you cannot do because you know exactly where it will lead you. And there are others it doesn't lead them there. That's never been an issue for them. Okay? Fill in the blanks however you need to. And what this is showing us is for this meat's sake, destroy not the work of God. Don't destroy the belief on the Lord Jesus Christ in this person. Not saying they're going to lose their salvation, but you can hurt somebody's belief. You can make it so that their faith is shaken. You can make it in your own life so that they don't see. Listen, there's a lot of false teachers in this world. And there's a lot of false teaching that goes against that book exactly as it's written. And there's a lot of things that subvert the faith of many. And there's things that place bitterness in people. And there's things that, that make it so that they can't even see the work of God. They can't even see things because your life goes in stark contrast to what they know the Word of God says. There, there may be somebody that thinks that, okay, we'll put it this way. This is, this is a good example of this. I heard it put this way the other day, and, and this fits, okay? I personally, and this is just me personally, I wouldn't have a problem mowing my, my lawn this afternoon if it needed it. I wouldn't. Now, there are people in here that that may offend. Because of that very reason, I won't mow my lawn. There's nothing in there that says you can't labor on the Sabbath. If we really want to dig in and get deep, the Sabbath is on Saturday. The Sabbath for the Christian ought to be every single day. They met every single day of the week and opened the Word of God and exhorted out of the Word of God. They did bring their, their first fruits into the storehouse the first day of the week towards the end of the book of Acts. But listen, if we want to, if we want to pattern our church after that, we should be meeting here every single day. We're really kind of close to that now. We got Sunday uh, twice, we got Monday, we got Wednesday, we got Thursday. All right? So there's three days where we're not meeting here. We do have the recording so people can hear the preaching of the Word of God. It ought to be so that anybody at any time can come in these doors and hear preaching. Honestly, you come to me, you want some preaching, I'll preach. You know, we'll get the Word of God going. Okay? So, what is the Sabbath? It was a time for the people of, of Israel to remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That remembering is their exodus up out of Egypt, the wanderings through the wilderness, and the passing over into the promised land. That was what that was to picture. Is that, that whole process, specifically 
the exodus up out of Egypt, what God brought them out of. This table here says this do in remembrance of me. That's our Sabbath. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Remember what Jesus took you out about of. Remember what you had in that old life in Egypt. Remember all that wickedness, the pain, the suffering, the anguish, the filthiness of that sin. And remember that with a clear conscience, you can praise Almighty God lifting up holy hands. Hands that are clean. From a heart that is purified by the Word of God. And you can bring these things before God. But listen, if it's going to offend somebody in here that I mow my lawn on Sunday, I'm not going to do it. Why? i got other times that I can do it. Okay? It's not an issue. It's not a problem. You're going to go ahead and tell me that you keep Sunday specifically only for the Word of God? The moment you got up in the morning, you were singing a hymn, and then you got into the Word of God, and you read it, and you meditated on it, and you prayed, and while you were getting ready to come to church, you were praying, and you were praising God and singing all these hymns. Pray that this is what you do. And then you got into that, that car, and, and you were put on some preaching, and you were, your, your soul is, is prepared, and you've been seeking the Lord, and you've been laying your heart out before Him, and, and you've been laying all of these things. You come into the house of God, and you sing the praises and the songs of Zion, and then you listen to the preaching of the Word of God, and these things are working effectually in you. And by the time you leave, you've, you've met with God. You know you've met with God. On the way home, you're talking about the Word of God. And you're talking about what God has shown you with your family. And then you get back into the Word. As soon as you walk in that door and, and you're helping your wife get lunch and, and you're talking about the Word of God then. And then you sit down at, at the lunch table and you're talking about the Word of God. And, and then you open up the Bible and you start reading together as a family and you sing a hymn together. This is what you do on Sunday? Anyone want to be in here honest and raise your hand and say that's what you do all day on Sunday, that your thoughts are fully encompassed around the Word of God? Then you're a hypocrite if you don't think I should mow my lawn. By the way, I always put in preaching when I mow the lawn. That's why I love mowing the lawn. Um, I have sound-canceling earbuds, so it helps keep my ears because I'm starting to go deaf. But... Okay. Examine ourselves, lest we also be tempted. Come on, let's edify one another. Let's not bite and devour. We're eating each other up. We're eating each other alive. You really think God's going to bless that? Hogwash. Mr. Miller, I found a bar of soap. It was body soap at the Rusty Rooster up in Portville. You know what it's called? Hogwash. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to get that thing so bad for you, but I didn't, and we just spilled the beans. All right. Well, I think that's where we're going to land. I pray the Lord used this, specifically his word. I, I, I trust I have the mind of Christ. I have this stark reminder up here, therefore let thy words be few. I just pray that God works as effectually in us. By the way, if God pointed his finger at something in you today, deal with that thing right now. Don't walk out those doors without dealing with it. Now, it very well may be God has turned up the pressure. Don't run to this altar just to get that pressure off. He may want you to sit under that pressure cooker for another couple hours or maybe a couple of days or maybe another couple more weeks. You know, that's how you can really tell if, if God moved into service, how long the fruit remains. Boy, we really met with God in that service. Yeah, Tuesday. Do you remember what happened on Sunday? How many, how many times does that happen? So, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. And uh, God, we look forward to the fruit that will remain from it. God, as you work those works in us, the work of God that we might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, well, Father, I pray that you would guard us against the wicked one, guard us against that, that uh, carnal mind which uh, so easily overtakes us. It's at enmity with you, Lord, and uh, God, we eschew it, we hate it. But Father, I pray that you would help us as we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, help us to walk in him, to know him, the power of his resurrection. 
the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable even unto his death. O God, work these things in us as you do oftentimes in the ways of man. We look for you to move now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.